<laughs> Welcome back, everyone. A little bit of technical difficulties, but we are back again. You good, Kyle? Perfect. Um, so, as I was saying, we've been working on, I've been working on this since beginning of last semester. I really started looking at the project beginning of, uh, really beginning of July into August, and the school year started mid, uh, mid August, beginning of September. I really had, I had no clue what I was going to look at. Um, I really wanted to look at the Underground Railroad here in Marietta, but unfortunately for me, there wasn't enough uh, primary sources and special collections in the library for me to do research on. So I reached out to um, Linda Showalter, who's an amazing woman, knows so much about Marietta history, and she is actually done research on Julia, um, Julia Cutler, who is uh, way for her cover sister, and she gave me a whole list of documents to read through, and once I had read through his speech, his story, uh, his correspondence, I was hooked on the topic. So I spent a whole semester doing this research, and now I have this present to you guys, so I hope you guys enjoy it. Congress has power to liberate slaves within a state, wrote William Parker Cutler in 1862, yet the startling voice of a resurrection trumpet Bidding a slumbering nation to awake to righteousness would be the greatest factor in the abolition movement. The push for emancipation of America, uh, for, of American slaves, consisted of fights in not only the legislation, but public opinion as well. Well, abolitionists such as Frederick Douglass and William Wood Garrison, that you all have heard of before, have gained national prominence. Lesser known members of the same movement, like Cutler, were instrumental in winning support from the bottom up. While the North was divided on how the Union should handle the spread of slavery, these local leaders emerged as advocates for extermination of the institution as a whole. Too often, the stories of these grassroots abolitionists go without being shared, doomed to slip between the cracks of history. The abolition movement, as we all know, was ultimately successful, but it required numerous advocates and sacrifices in the fight. Political and social leaders across the country pushed forward the effort. In Ohio, Republican William Parker Cutler was certainly one of these leaders. A politician, a politician from right here in the river town of Marietta, Ohio, Cutler was a local abolitionist who advocated who openly, to openly stop the spread of slavery and the message of emancipation. While many Appalachians kept their fights against slavery at a local level, Cutler earned himself the opportunity to take his fight to, to across the state and nationally as a congressional representative. Arguing in the U.S. House of Representatives for immediate abolition, Cutler advocated for Congress to respond to the pressure put on by his fellow Republicans um, excuse me. Overall, Representative Cutler's criticism of slavery was publicly commended and well received throughout Ohio. Yet, his outspoken abolitionism ultimately played a key role in his failure for congressional reelection in 1862. Born in Marietta on July 12, 1812, Cutler was a public servant throughout the entirety of his life. Cutler's role as an abolitionist should not come as a surprise to any who know his family lineage. The Cutler family goes hand in hand with the prevention of slavery here in Ohio. William's grandfather, Manasseh Cutler, was an influential member of the Ohio Company, the organization that first purchased and settled the Northwest Territory. When developing the new territory, uh, leaders of the Ohio Company debated over whether the institution of slavery should be permitted or outlawed in the ungoverned land. Manasseh played the most important role by far, being the one who prepared the part of the Ordinance of 1787 banning slavery. With a new document governing the unorganized Western land following the American Revolution, Article 6 of, Northwest, of the Northwest Ordinance effectively blocked slavery and involuntary servitude in all territories between Pennsylvania and the Mississippi River. Manasseh wrote that he based his decision on the ideas that religious morality did not permit slavery in the, new, in the new region, therefore it was his duty to block and prevent its spread. The Cutler family activism continued on to the next generation with, with Ephraim, William's father. Ephraim Cutler was a longtime practicing attorney and judge in the new territory. In 1802, he served as a delegate to the convention held in Chillicothe to create a governing document for the state of Ohio. With the debate over slavery being intense and bitter, the delegates found themselves in a tie over whether to permit slavery or not in the state of Ohio. As the story goes, Ephraim Cutler was is said to have been horribly ill during the time of debate, uh, yet he still traveled to Chillicothe and cast the tie-breaking vote to keep slavery outlawed. If not for Ephraim, Slavery may have been legalized in Ohio and other in the other states that followed. As one can assume, the major roles that both William's grandfather and father played in preventing the spread of slavery and served as an inspiration for Cutler as he began his own political career. William Parker Cutler's deep religious ties were also especially deep rooted. 
Uh, as his uncle, as Dr. Torbert uh, mentioned, was a devout preacher of the Bible who spread the message of Christianity universalism throughout Appalachia. Daniel Parker, which you can read about in this wonderful book by Dr. Torbett, <laughs> was the brother of William's mother, Sally, and a universalist preacher that traveled throughout the Ohio Valley. Aside from delivering sermons, Daniel Parker also served, served the community as an outspoken advocate against slavery. His opposition to slavery was longstanding and, like most Americans, evolved from the initial silence evolved from initial silence to private moral disapproval to public activism. He spread the theological reasoning as to why slavery could not be permitted to exist in America. Parker's teachings throughout Ohio, Kentucky, and Tennessee, along with his stern abolitionism, likely inspired William Parker Cutler to, to pursue a similar path. Cutler's journey to become an abolitionist began with his public service in politics. By the time the rebellion broke out in the South, Cutler had already found himself as a political figure here in Marietta. Following his education at Ohio University in Athens, Cutler ran for the Ohio General Assembly in 1842. Yet his attempt failed when he lost to George M. Woodbridge, an independent who was backed by the Democrats here in the region. Two years later, Cutler ran again for the House of Representatives and as a member of the Whig Party, winning nomination and then election by his constituents. During his final term in office, Cutler was chosen to serve as a Speaker of the Ohio House from 1846 to 1848. In the State House was where William Parker Cutler established himself as a household name here in southeastern Ohio. At the, conclusion as, at the conclusion of his time in the Ohio House of Representatives, Cutler continued his, his interest in public affairs at the turn of the decade. In 1850, Cutler was chosen as a member from Washington County to sit on the Constitutional Convention to discuss amendments that would change the present governing document of Ohio. Like his father before him, Cutler spoke on behalf of the citizens of Marietta in the surrounding area, giving, boy, giving a voice to the people of Southeastern Ohio. At this convention, Cutler gained support of the Whig nominee, uh, Cutler gained support as the Whig nominee for governor of Ohio from other delegates who were also Whigs, yet even though he appreciated the sentiment, he turned it down as he wanted to retreat into his private life for a little bit. For the next 10 years, Cutler retreated from the spotlight of politics and instead pursued the interests of the railroad industry, where he worked as an advocate for the construction of railroads throughout the Union. Cutler rose through the ranks up to the position of presidency, where he was the head of the Marietta and Cincinnati Railroad Company, which for a short time was operational from in 1857 before it was reorganized into the Union Railroad when the war was in full swing. At the end of his tenure as president of the railroad, William Parker Cutler again decided to return to the world of politics. In 1860, Cutler ran as a Republican, which came out of the Whig Party, um, for the U.S. Congress as a representative for the 16th District here in Southeastern Ohio. The district consisted of territory from Morgan County, Washington County, and Muskingum counties. Cutler ended up defeating Zanesville Democratic Judge Hugh G. Jewett earning him a spot in the House. Led by an outspoken group of Republican radicals uh, and backed by Lincoln's presidency, this 37th Congress was tasked with acting during the arguably the most critical period of, in the nation's short history. This congressional body, excuse me, this congressional body was directly responsible for taking military action in the South, increasing federal spending during the war, and setting the precedent of suspension of habeas corpus, along with passing a long series of other bills that would grow the country for decades to come. Cutler's time as a, as a representative was fairly quiet, voting along Republican lines and supporting the decisions of President Lincoln during his presidency. However, during 1861, in the spring session of Congress, in the final year of his term, William Parker Cutler inserted himself into the discussion in a major way. House Bill 106 was introduced in December of the previous year and aimed to force Congress's hand in suppressing the Southern Rebellion by abolishing slavery. The bill stated that slavery has caused the present rebellion in the United States. And whereas there can be no solid and permanent peace in the Union, this Republic is so in this Republic so that as long as this institution exists. On April 23rd, 1862, Cutler took the floor of the House of Representatives to affirm this, his support for this bill, ultimately adding to the push for emancipation. So I have a few documents that I'm going to pass around. I have five copies right here. Um, the top, the top one here is 
a copy of his speech, and the other ones that and the other ones that are beneath this are other documents I'll be talking about throughout here. So um, pass on a few of these. I have five copies here. If you guys could take a second, look through here, pass them around. At the end of the conversation, or at the end of the discussion, I also have copies if you guys wish to take home with you as well. If you guys are interested in reading those. <clears throat> in his speech, Cutler condemned the institution of slavery as a whole, assigning the responsibility to the federal government to put an end to the practice. Like many in the Republican Party, Cutler admitted in his own speech that he once viewed slavery as something that could be addressed locally by state governments. He wrote that he once believed that Congress, having no rights over slavery, had no duties to perform in the, prim on the, in the premises. Yet, he also acknowledged that he had come to realize that it is the right and duty of Congress to destroy every enemy that threatens the national life, with slavery being at the top of the list. With Republicans having the majority in the congressional body, Cutler is making an appeal for them to act immediately. Cutler addressed the impact that he saw, that he saw slavery having on the well-being of the country and its people. Slavery, he argued, would have detrimental co consequences to the United States well past what members would see if it was permitted to exist any longer. Cutler stated that the effects of a long continued degradation of laborers cannot be confined to its immediate victims. By disrespecting the freedoms of those forced into labor, slavery would take away the power from the very nation people that permit it to exist. Cutler was also very forthcoming in how he believed America should address the issue of slavery. His response to the most wicked rebellion, as he repeatedly said in his speech, Cutler argued that there was no remedy for such outrages besides except by removing their only cause. Only by prohibiting the institution of slavery could the rebellion be stopped and the welfare of the nation be, be preserved. Excuse me. Cutler justified his anti-slavery message with reference to the Bible, like his uncle before him, and ideals of morality that many Christian abolitionists held. Those who supported slavery often tried to use Christian ideas as a basis for the enslavement of others. Cutler responded to such notions by saying that slave owners were in fact acting contrary to the wishes of God. By having denied slaves earnings, families, wife, children, everything that men desire to live for. Slave owners blotted out from sight God's revealed pathway to a better world. In all, Cutler saw that the agitation of rebellion and the horrors of slavery would continue until the Christian men in the Congress chose to act with the judgment of a Christian nation, emphasizing the love that one must have for their neighbor rather than greed and selfishness. Most advocates for slavery directed attention to Article 4, Section 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution, which is widely known as the Fugitive Slave Act, or the Fugitive Slave Clause, um, as an indicator of the document's uh, sanction of slavery as a whole. Yet in a speech, Cutler stated that while the Constitution didn't, did guarantee the return of fugitive slaves, it does, not follow, it does not follow that it undertook to keep the supply of fugitive slaves up. He contended that even if the life of the institution had been guaranteed by the Constitution, as a public enemy to the nation's prosperity, its right to life is forfeited and therefore must be abolished by this Congress. A monumental attack on slavery as a whole, Cutler's speech yielded numerous positive responses from fellow advocates of abolition throughout the months that followed. It was shared all throughout Ohio that a, con a congressional representative from the small town of Marietta um, had taken the floor in Washington and openly called for the immediate abolition of slavery, the immediate abolition of slavery. Since Ohio had a sizable population of Southern sympathizers, Cutler's speech was a major win for the abolition movement. Soon after the speech was delivered, Cutler's wife Elizabeth wrote to her husband saying that people were asking nearly every day if they could have their own copy of William's speech, which he did send to many. Um, he wrote in his own he wrote in his own correspondence that he had been receiving many letters, and that as long as that they had their uh, addresses attached to it, he would return his own copy of the speech there. In the local newspaper, Cutler's speech was published and shared for neighbors and colleagues to read. In a newspaper article titled Mr. Cutler's Speech, an anonymous author wrote that Cutler, as a faithful guardian of the national life, presented his views on slavery for abolition in a manly, frank, and independent manner. 
The column concluded with hoping that every single one of Cutler's constituents may have the opportunity of reading and resonating with the words of their elected congressman. One, lo one local Marietta named T.J. Mumford took a great pleasure in reading his own uh, copy of the speech that Cutler had sent him. He offered to Cutler his certainty and trust that the clearness and force of his speech will reach the hearts of his constituents, all but assuring his re-election in the coming fall. The response extended far past Marietta and farther down the Ohio River as well. Cutler's congressional address yielded a response from Cincinnati, a hub of abolitionist and underground railroad activity. Alfonso Taft here, a practicing attorney, a future U.S. Attorney General, and Secretary of War, and also the father of 27th President William H. Taft, wrote to Cutler to express his satisfaction with the speech. Taft was an abolitionist himself in Cincinnati, and later an outspoken advocate for the constitutional amendment granting African Americans the right to vote. In his letter to Cutler, Taft wrote that uh, he had read the speech with great pleasure and sympathized with his argument entirely. Taft expressed to Cutler that if such speeches as yours cannot arouse Congress and the government to act, we cannot hope for a favorable outcome for the North. While Cutler's stern criticism of slavery had numerous positive responses from Ohioans, there also existed worries that his actions would prove harmful for his political uh, future. Cutler indicated in his personal writings that he had concerns that his speech was too uncompromising uh, to gain the favor of those stuck in the middle. In a letter written to his wife Elizabeth, William wrote that he had sincere concerns that his views were probably too strong on the subject of slavery to meet general approbation from the public. He also had strong doubts that any Democrats, Northern or Southerners, would be willing to support him in his stance and any political endeavors he had in the future. Cutler writes that there were enemies from enemies of his on both sides of the party, uh, Republican and Democrats, who would look to capitalize on his vocalness as an opportunity to lay him aside politically and take his position in office. With fall approaching, if his concerns were, to, were true, Cutler's time as a, as a representative might be quickly coming to an end. The congressional election of 1862 was held on October 14th, just six months after Cutler delivered his speech. If he was to secure his re-election in the district, Cutler needed to keep an open, keep up an active campaign with strong public support in not just Marietta, but the surrounding area as well. While typically incumbents have an organic advantage when it comes to congressional elections and challenging political opponents, William Parker Cutler did not have such an edge. As is procedure with every decade, a U.S. Census was held in 1860, and beginning in June and concluding after five months. As a result, Cutler's 16th congressional district that elected him in 1859 was combined with the 17th district um, in the Northeast. The new district contained all of Washington County, all of Monroe County, and added in parts of Athens and Memphis County, and lost all of Morgan and Muskegon County, um, which was a major shift, which what he had been used to. Uh, in his previous election. In competition for the newly formed 15th District of Ohio, Cutler was pitted against yet another incumbent from the same, from the same congressional seat. Cutler's, Cutler's political adversary in the 1862 election was Democrat James R. Morris, a longtime attorney out of Woodsfield in Monroe County. Morris was not the first member of his family to serve in Congress, as his father, Joseph, was also elected um, 20 years earlier and served for two consecutive congressional terms. The Morris family established himself as a public servant in, in Monroe County and other parts of the district, rivaling that of Cutler and his family here in Washington County. The support that Cutler had earned himself in, the, in his hometown of Marietta was especially strong. Um, months before the election took place, the encouragement that Cutler received seemed to indicate that his odds of re-election were favorable and that he had almost nothing to worry about. Local people took to the newspaper to express their support for Cutler. In print, they wrote articles that called for his re-election of not just Cutler, but other Republicans who shared the same sentiment as he did. In the Marietta Register, a paper newly formed in 1862, they published that the Union men for election were a part of a good and strong ticket of Republican men. They foresaw that all would be elected by a large majority with no doubt on their behalf. When speaking on Cutler in particular, the article held him in the same high standard as the other Republicans. They wrote that he was an honest and able man who acknowledged a leading, who acknowledged as a leading member in the present Congress, concluding with the idea that his re-election re could be regarded as certain here for the people in Washington County and the district. These strong contentions in the public sphere appeared auspicious 
uh, Cutler's campaign, yet there were doubts that his efforts would end successfully after all. Despite the expressed public support for his re-election, there existed early indication that Cutler's re-election was not as definitive as many Marietta people wished to believe. Like in the correspondence between Cutler and his, and his wife, uh, William P. Cutler's sister also wrote him, Julia. Um, she wrote down her own concerns as to whether or not uh, Cutler would be re-elected. She believed that Cutler's strong advocacy against slavery and uh, she believed that it had negatively affected her brother's political career. Julia wrote that William was, was being constantly warned by his Republican colleagues that if he wished to see a re-election, then he should not come out so plainly against slavery um, as a cause of rebellion. And by doing so, Cutler would effectively lose the support of Northern Democrats in the region and deal substantial blows to his hopes of uh, being re-elected. Julia wrote in her personal diary, that Democrats were assembling secret organizations throughout the district, holding meetings at night and telling lies on paper and pamphlets, all as a way to combat her brother's chance of re-election and stopping the spread of slavery. As the war raged on in the South, voter demographics were also changed here in the North. While the number of soldiers volunteering from Ohio continued to rise throughout the counties that surround us right now, the Republican of voters dwindled. At the same time, the majority of Democrats that enlisted to fight for them Excuse me. The majority of Democrats did not enlist to fight for the Union, putting the Republican ticket at a major disadvantage. In the newly added counties, a shift in voter population was certainly noticeable. In Meigs County, one out of 200 men who volunteered to fight for the Union. Out, out of the 200 men that uh, volunteered to fight for the Union, not more than three of those voters were registered Democrats. In Athens County, approximately 100 men volunteered, and not six of those men were Democrats. Everyone was a Republican, taking away crucial voters that of William Park Cutler needed for his re-election. As crucial as the enlisting soldiers was for the Union Army, it proved to be as equally as harmful for the Republican politicians who supported that army. Many Republicans hoped that they could sway enough voters in this new demographic to earn their support, yet for Cutler, such a shift never happened. He continued to campaign on the same position that he always had. In July of 1862, just a few months before the election, Cutler addressed a large crowd of people in downtown Marietta at the courthouse. He looked to incite the same reaction in the district that he had in Washington, D.C. months before. He once again preached for the support of immediate abolition and the prohibition of slavery in all current and future territories in the U.S. and the United States of America, expressing his loyalty to President Lincoln and the Republican Party as a whole. His unwillingness to waver from the anti-slavery ideals that had drived his political career proved to ultimately be his downfall. Cutler's adversary, Cutler's adversary capitalized on the strong stance that William took, um, using his own words as a way to appeal to the greater number of Democrats that still existed in their district. In his campaign, James Morris took a moderate approach to the rebellion dealing with the issues, and dealing with the issues of slavery. Morris knew that if his campaign was similar to Cutler, he, by publicly calling for the immediate abolition of slavery and attacking the Southerners who seceded from the Union, he would risk losing favor from his Democratic constituents. At a last minute event during his run for re-election, Morris stated that, like his opponent, he truly was in favor of suppressing the Southern Rebellion, but he left out the issue of slavery and abolition as a whole and overlooked it. Such a tactic was intentional uh, to appeal to both the Republicans who supported the war efforts and the Democrats who weren't totally sold on absolute emancipation in the territory. Morris was also strategic in where he traveled on his campaign trail campaign trail, targeting areas like Newport, Matamoros, and large, pack, large sections of Monroe County with outstanding bases of Democratic voters. This ultimately earned Morris support in areas in the district that Cutler just was not able to reach and could not sway to his side. When the results of the election were finalized, Cutler had found that his, ex that his efforts had fallen short. His abolitionist platform had, had sown deep divides between himself and the district Democrats and could not be overcome. The results of the election were posted in the, in the local Meredith newspaper showing that Morris had won 52.9% of all voters in the district, while Cutler could only earn 47.1%. The totals were 3,043 votes totally cast for Morris and 2,617 cast for William P. Cutler. Cutler was not the only Republican to lose in the election as several other of the union tickets also lost their bow against their Democratic counterparts. In the 15th district, the breakdown of voting was very much lopsided between the two districts, between the two candidates. 
Cutler had a grip on the Marriott and Harbor area like he had many years before, but was unable to persuade many to the Northeast. The townships that were previously in the 17th district went almost unanimously to Morris. The townships of Union, Independence, Grandview, Fairfield, and Ludlow, all within 20 miles up the river of Marietta, played crucial roles in Cutler's defeat. In these five townships, Morris uh, acclimated 902 ballots cast in his favor, while Cutler only earned 128. Cutler's influence over the greater Marietta area, area did not waver since his previous election. Uh, he took Marietta by storm, yet he struggled in areas outside of his hometown. He was clearly unable to make a dent in the primarily Democratic townships that Morris took with ease. While it's likely that Morris would have won his previous uh, district as a whole, such a marginal defeat when Cutler was so wildly popular must be traced back to a singular cause, Cutler's unyielding abolitionism and his unwillingness to stray from what he believed was right. In the congressional election taking place in the divided Appalachia, Cutler's devotion to the abolition movement and his reluctance to move from a radical Republican platform were the most crucial factors in both his political success and his downfall. If Cutler's congressional district was not located in the Appalachian border between free states and previously slave states, the outcome of the election might have been totally different. The pro-slavery influence on Southern Ohio from slaveholder states such as Kentucky and Virginia was inherently strong. Such feelings were present in parts of Cutler's district as West Virginia previously used to be Virginia, a slaveholder state right across the river. As thousands of Republicans voters traveled from their home to serve against the Southern Rebellion, the remaining number of Democrats in the district just proved to be too overwhelming for those who stood against slavery. The impact that William Parker Cutler's abolitionism, abolitionism had on numerous people in the Marietta and Marietta and other parts of Appalachia is undeniable. Yet it's one of the key reasons why his time in Congress was so short-lived. With the war ending in April, in April of 1865 and the 13th Amendment effectively abolishing slavery coming soon after, Cutler's anti-slavery activism transformed into another, into other interests. After his congressional stint, Cutler eventually returned to the railroad industry um, in, in, the late, in the late 1860s, but never took the helm of operations like he did once before. He also continued his involvement in the Marietta, the Marietta community, serving as a trustee for Marietta College and for the Ohio Archaeological and Historical Society for the remainder of his life. Following his, following his death on April 11, 1889, William Parker was in Oak Grove Cemetery in Marietta, along with, along, with his life, along with his wife Elizabeth, which is where they remain to this day. Um, there was one afternoon where I went and searched for his grave, and I eventually found it. And as soon as I finished looking, it started downpour as soon as I got this picture. So I think that's a sign that I, I would pick the right person. <laughs> like many other Appalachian abolitionists, there is no monument immortalizing Cutler in his fight against slavery. There are no commemoration of his speech, no conviction, or conviction as a congressman. There's no parade celebrating his no value. Adding his story to the broader app so the broader American historical narrative offers a better and more complete portrait of the abolition of the Appalachian abolition movement that is often lost in more prominent figures in history. Though he may have lost his reelection, William Parker Cutler won by inspiring countless Americans with the ideas of the anti-slavery movement, even if the memory of his personal contributions faded over time. I want to give a special thanks to Dr. Katie McDaniel, who helped me all the way through this, Dr. David Torbett for reading over my stuff. Ms. Linda Showalter for offering me as a guide through the special collections, Mary to Luck and Mary to Special Collections, and to Ms. Katie Scullin for helping me as well. Uh, without their support, I wouldn't be able to complete this and I wouldn't be here sending to you guys. I also want to thank my family for supporting me all the way, my wonderful girlfriend for doing so, and my brothers and Alpha Todd Mega for helping me as well. And I want to thank you guys for coming out tonight. So thank you. So now we're going to move to Q and A. I'm going to get things set up so Tyler can answer all the questions in the audience as well as uh, in person here. And so just give me a second to set those things up. And so for those of you who are online, just use the Q and A portion, and we'll be answering the questions for Tyler to answer live for us all. All right. So Tyler, go ahead and answer the Q and A. Perfect. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So when I was doing research, I found a lot about the Merida Anti-Slavery Society here, and they. Could you repeat the question? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I like that. So the question was, how did losing the Zanesville and Muskegon area affect uh, William Parker Cutler in his re-election campaign? And uh, is, that, is that all of it? Perfect. Um, so when I was doing my research, I found that there was a Washington County anti-slavery anti society that was very much mimicking that of Muskegon County. Um, like you said, they had a very strong base there. And I think losing that with a strong number of um, Republicans as well I think that definitely hurt his chances there because there was such a strong anti-slavery sentiment in Muskegon County. And I think because it is farther away from the Ohio River and the influence of Virginia and Kentucky as well, I think that definitely made an influence, a, a difference in the support that he had in the district. Now, is there a way to open up this so I can see both? Any other questions in the meantime? Do you think for his wife, from Lizzie, his wife, Elizabeth? Yes. Did you read anything or something? Yeah. Correspondences? Or? Yeah, so one of the letters actually passed out there was yeah. correspondence oh, yeah. to there. And another one um, that I did not include that I've read was just she she really mimicked the support that he had in Ohio and Marietta and Southeastern Ohio. Thank you for that. Um, because she never get back to him because obviously he could not hear from every single constituents, but people had been approaching her and his family members saying how much they supported him, especially after the Marietta newspaper published his speech, um, saying how positive the reaction was for him, which was almost a telltale sign that he had a re-election in the bag in a sense. And then when he returned to have his advisors and have his counselors tell him that he did not be so not be so absolute in its abolition, it was kind of a page turner for him. So one of the questions is, I read some, I read that some abolitionists believe in the inferiority and the inherent inferiority of black people, even though they were against slavery. I heard the same thing about Lincoln, about Lincoln. Did that apply to Cutler? So there is nothing that indicated that to me when I was reading through his, um, through his speech and through his, uh, personal memoirs and through his letters and correspondence, he really believed that all people were inherently equal. He, every single thing that traced back to his religious upbringing, to his, uh, to his mentorship under his father and his grandfather, that reinforced that, that he believed that all people truly were equal. Um, there was nothing indicated that he was doing it purely for political office or purely for re-election, that every single thing that he read and that he advocated for in Washington was what he truly endeared to him. Yes. So the question was, was he a student at Merida College? He actually was not. He graduated from a high university. Yeah, which is kind of so much middle and creating Ohio University and then sure. yeah and I believe actually his son because he had he had children as well one of his sons went to Ohio University as well but he did return to he stayed here in Marietta and worked on the board of trustees here for the remainder of his life. That's cool. So the question was, what did he do during Reconstruction after the Civil War ended and uh, the emancipation of slaves was had? That's the hard part is because he had retreated from public life. He had went back to the railroad. He went to the Archaeological and Historical Society. I, at least not here in Marietta that I've read. I don't have that information to share uh, what he did, whether he continued his uh, support for the for um, the Republican Party, or whether he had kind of turned once the party had started to flip and everything happened during Reconstruction. So it's, it's hard to say what he did during that time period, just because I've not read the documents or if, if they even exist. So 
what happened with the railroad? So after it was bought out by, because it was originally the Marietta and Cincinnati Railroad, and then it was bought out by the Union. Oh, yeah, excuse me. The question was, what, what was had with the railroad? What happened to it? Once it um, was bought out by the Union, he had worked on it for a long time. And then I actually do not know what happened after his retirement, or because he, he did retire before his death, because he retired back to his home with Elizabeth. Um, I would assume that it just continued on with the, uh, being rebranded beyond just the Union Railroad Company. I would assume it would take a different name, but I'm not sure what happened to the railroad. Uh, how old was he when he was a congressman? So the question was, how old was he when he was a congressman? <laughs> Let me go back to my notes here if I have that somewhere. Hmm, so he was elected in um, 1859, uh, and he was born on, what did I say? 1812. So he would have been 47, right? Check my math. I don't do math. Um, <laughs> yeah, history major for a reason. But forty-seven, um, which honestly was sizably young as a. I mean, even now, forty-seven for a congressman is fairly young. Typically, they are older. So I would just show. I would say that shows the influence that the Cutlers had, um, because I believe Manasseh was also a congressman as well. He was elected. Um, so that just shows the influence that the Cutler family had on, in Washington and here in Southeast Ohio. Do you know if the sons continued on in politics? Not, no, not. So the question was, um, did his sons continue on in politics? Not that I could find, at least not on a U.S. House of Representatives or a, a, a Ohio House of Representative level. Um, there's no record that his sons continued on the same path that he had. Um, I believe that one was a farmer here um, out towards Vincent area, um, more towards uh, Athens, but none, none really continued on to carry on his father's legacy. Yes. Yeah, did you find any uh, information about wanting to uh, rerun for office when they changed and allowed the soldiers to vote? For the first time in history in the 64 election, whether so, he considered running again. Yeah. So the question was whether or not I found any, any information about whether he wanted to rerun for office in uh, 1864 when they allowed voters that return to vote for congressmen and representatives. Um, and none of his correspondence had he had any interest in, at least not that he'd indicated, for re-election, that he would have been fully dedicated to uh, the Merida area, dedicated to, uh, he took a great interest in the uh, Archaeological and Historical Society. Um, I would say likely because of the strong history of the area as well, but he did not indicate that he had any interest of running for a second term non-consecutively. Any other questions? If you think about the president of the second time, well, so you can try to use how people thought about the other one. The question was, uh, did I think about the present time at all when I was doing this when I was doing this presentation, all my research with rebellions, with uh, voting changes, with redistricting, stuff like that? And it's hard not to. I think it's hard not to see how uh, uh, see how I don't want to say history repeats itself because I think that's the biggest cliche in the world. Um, but to see how things do happen over and over again, to see how um, minor things like redistricting, um, uh, wasn't really gerrymandering at the time for this, but how people leaving certain populations can make such a difference for someone that's such a strong support of voters just a few years before that. Mm -hmm. How would you contrast your Marietta College history education with your public school history education? <laughs> Jack always causes trouble. Yeah. <laughs> the, the question was, how would I compare my Marietta College education to my public to the public school education that I had growing up in high school, right? Yeah, yeah, in history. yeah and in history, and I think. 
the main difference is is that um, you get a more unfiltered version, uh, to say the least. I think that here I have autonomy in what I can study, um, getting the truest version of how history, especially here in America, because it's so important to learn uh, what actually happened, uh, even if it is an ugly truth, that we teach that to those who are going to be the next generation. Um, I think that filtering things like that, um, I think it takes away from the beauty and the bitterness of history. Um, I, here at Marietta, I've been so grateful because my professors, they don't give a pretty picture, the black and white thing. It, you get a lot of grace in there. You, you get a lot of, um, you get a lot of the things they don't teach you in public, in, in public schools that I'm so grateful that has opened my eyes to how history is actually going for us. I think that's how we move forward as a country and as a people. Yes. Uh, this is a question that I wanted to share that uh, my sister and I have been working on the archives of the Congregational Church in Indiana for probably almost three years. And we found some really fascinating documents, uh, national survey documents. They were resolutions where the church actually voted um, uh, against slavery. Mm -hmm. And I thought maybe you can share some of that. Um, well, well, some in some of the the Cutler family, uh, his sister Sarah Cutler Dawes is a member of that church. So again, that a lot of those um, feelings and sentiments were, were carried on through uh, through other community uh, information. Really, that's really interesting. Yeah. And, and they had um, just like they wouldn't allow um, a person to be minister. I just shows how strong the sentiment was here in Marietta and the anti slavery Society and everything else for the abolition movement. I think that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. And the documents are actually uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. I really do appreciate that. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you guys once again for having me. I really appreciate it. And like I said before, I do have a few copies of his full speech. If you guys are interested, um, I will put them out here on the table if anyone's interested in grabbing them. And thank you guys. Yeah. All right. Thank you all for attending and thank you online and thank you both for sticking with us during our technical difficulties. Appreciate that. And we hope you see you for our next third Thursday talk on the third Thursday of April. All right. All right. We'll see you all then. Thank you so much. Have a nice dry night. <laughs>